what is academic freedom and is it getting better or worse and why does academic freedom matter? Well, having been an academic all my life, I guess, um, I've become acutely aware of a problem, namely academic freedom. When I was a graduate student, uh, it seemed to be, to the extent that we ever thought about it, that most faculty were, in fact, free to say what they wanted to say, and they had academic freedom because they had tenure. So that was in the late 50s, early 60s. It seemed like, at least to us, uh, most professors were, um, at least 90% were either tenured already or were on tenure tracks. And then now, I want to mention a couple of specific estimates that were made and published. In uh, 1980, uh, it had dropped to 70%. 70% of faculty were tenured, or in tenure, no tenured actually, tenured or tenure track. In 2010, 30 years later, it had dropped to 30%. The most recent data I got, just in fact, just prior to this meeting, only 9% of acad academics these days, 9% are actually tenured. 30% are on tenure tracks, but that doesn't mean tenure because they're still vulnerable. So now there's only one out of every, every 11 academics that's actually tenured. I was fortunate I got tenure at a very young age, and so it's one of the reasons I guess I turned out to jump, to jump off the ship sometimes. Uh, but in any case, uh, I'm really deeply concerned about this because as tenure has declined, it's very dramatic, and I think it's almost going to disappear. I know there's problems with tenure, by the way. Um, you know, people could be tenured and sort of sit there and do nothing, and so the story goes. Uh, but uh, the tenure, the decline in tenure uh, in this country now is very serious, and I have to tell you, knowing my colleagues as I do, there's a lot of colleagues, for example, that well, I'm very inclined to agree with what I'm talking about, if you will, uh, but they don't say anything about it because it's against the institutional, um, you know, powers, if you powers that be. One could get in trouble by going, quite frankly, to where I went to. And uh, <coughs> so, I, and this is something public tend not to know. I don't know whether Dr. Williams, you knew those figures, uh, but only 9%. And as you know, it's, and that was 2011. It's almost gone. And uh, I've looked into some of the reasons for that, the discussions that surrounded that, that attempt to bring, quote unquote, liberal professors under control. It started the Nixon administration. You can see there some decisions being made by a certain Lewis Powell, who then was appointed to the Supreme Court by Nixon, who wrote a uh, document uh, to the Chamber of Commerce at the time, and it was remained secret for four or five years. But he made it very clear that uh, the problem with, with uh, in this system of uh, conveying public information was the fact that there were all these liberal professors, he says. And he was particularly identifying ones at Cornell because it's joined by a rather famous Cornellian at the time, a certain man by the name of Olin. And so they really got vigorous at that time to bring this under control, and that's when the tenure started to decline. Somehow, I don't know whether it was the underground movement or what, but I see this as a very serious problem because my colleagues, most of whom don't have tenure or aren't even on tenure track, they're sometimes just uh, contracted, uh, we're now on at campuses, being, we're now contracting people for offering courses and they better not open their mouths too wide um, and talk about things that aren't popular. So in answer to your question, Steve, I think it's very serious. It's serious not just for academics and whether or not they can speak, I think it's a serious matter for the public at large. If you want to you know, have an institution where they're free to really speak what they have to say, what they have learned, um, it's getting into a sad state of affairs now. It's a big problem. So you're asking ex um, my experience at University of Chicago, Wayne State, and now Rush. Um, it's, it's been interesting that uh, really it got changed with the gentleman, I'm, forgive me, I won't remember his name because I'm not a gastroenterologist, the, but the gentleman who went around saying that Helicobacter pylori was the cause of ulcers and he was vilified and thrown out. It's kind of like Soma Weiss was put in an insane asylum for saying that people should wash their hands. <laughs> uh, um, and, and it turns out that we've gotten so used to, in the medical side, in, in academic medicine, of 
game changers, just flipping what we knew. I mean, how many of us saw the reports on lung cancer if you do more than 55 micrograms of B12 per day? I mean, it's like all the stuff that we think we know, we have to be ready for it to be flipped on its head. And so um, I don't think we have as much of a problem with it. The problem we have is the financial aspects of tenure. And so, and the, and the lack of productivity in some people who have ruined it for others. And so, uh, I actually, because I was a clinical researcher, I had no chance of tenure at the University of Chicago. Uh, when I took over the division at Wayne State, I was given tenure. And it was fine for me, but I, w I saw what was happening is that if people were not being clinically productive financially, um, they could be reduced to their tenure line, which was $25,000. You couldn't live off of that. And so, but so devaluing it or making it so, yes, you're tenured, but we can still fire you because you're not doing X, Y, Z. So is it really tenure? Of course not. And so changing the definition, changing the value, that, that's what I see in academic medicine. I guess um, what I'd like to see is that it, it, I, I'm thinking about what you said and I'm concerned about it. And of course, I know your story too. And isn't it interesting that in order to tell the truth, you have to get some kind of permission. But seriously, think about what we're saying here, that telling the truth is such a dangerous thing that unless you have some type of insurance policy, you can't tell the truth. And I think that's the problem. And it isn't limited to the university setting. It's limited, I mean, you know what the state tried to do to me, right? You start talking about these things in a truthful manner and um, the government comes after you or the powers that be come after you. So, so I think we've got to get to the place where the expectation is that everybody's gonna tell the truth and that we start to gain enough personal integrity that we do it whatever the price is. I mean, I, I t got inspired by your willingness to do it. I've thought about you a lot when I've been in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I didn't blame you, by the way. I just thought, you know, you took a heck of a chance when you started talking about a lot of things that were controversial. And so I think this is, I think one of the things that we can do to counteract it is again to, to travel in packs, really, and make it safe for, for people to stand up and say the truth. And um, if, if more and more people do it, more and more people will do it. Um, let me ask you something very similar. What percentage of the scientific research and development is funded by the private sector, and how does that compare to 50 years ago, and why does this matter? The same data I referred to a moment ago about the percentage of ten tenure changing, there was actually the flip side in terms of percent of total research, of medical research, of biological medical research uh, being funded by private sector. Uh, now, with the third, when it got down to 30 percent academic uh, thing in 2011, 2010, 2011, at that time, now it's said, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with these data, but they did the work. 70% of the total research is being done is funded by the private sector. 70%. So while tenure is going down, the percent of the total being funded by corporate interest is going up. And uh, so I, I really just don't like it. I, I just, uh, I think it's a dangerous, dangerous trend. I don't know whether somebody has better numbers than that or not. But. Well, the, the dangerous trend is that in, in certain cases, industry has completely bought the academic department, you know, academia. And it's very, I remember one, um, one thing I read about a committee trying to find um, a psychiatrist, an academic psychiatrist who was not on the payroll of the drug companies. They really couldn't find anybody. I mean, there was no such person available. And there's quite a bit that's been written about the food companies doing this, that they, they strategize and plan to go out and control, you know, by funding um, academia in important ways. And, and by the way, one thing I think we have to acknowledge, food companies are for-profit entities. They're not social service agencies. And we've got to stop thinking that we're going to do something to them to make them start behaving this way because that's not what they're going to do. So the only thing that we can do, in my opinion, because the government's so corrupt, I don't think we're going to get any laws passed that really rein them in in a meaningful way. And they always rightly say, that you can't interfere with their right to do business any more than you can the furniture companies in North Carolina. So we have to dry up demand. That's the only way this is really gonna shift is to dry up demand for, for things that are not good. 
because, and, and I'll, show, I'll tell you something, this really inspires me when I think about it. When I started in this business 22 years ago, I live in Columbus, Ohio, all right? So there was no good food in grocery stores. They used to have a little section at Kroger. It was about this big, and they called it health food. And then you know what was in the rest of the store, not health food, right? There was one health food store, and it was the size of my bedroom, and you had to wear your beads and sing Aquarius when you went in there, because it was such a strange and unusual place. We used to take people on field trips to the health food store because we were afraid they would just see the people with you know, all the earrings and everything and just and tattoos and walk out. So now I want to tell you about Columbus today. This is, this is just the shift in 22 years, all right? And this is based on demand. Today we have uh, three Whole Foods. We have three Trader Joe's. The Kroger store a mile from my house has everything I want to eat. I don't have to go any further than that. I can go to any restaurant in Columbus and order a meal and a restaurant owner opening a new restaurant told a dispatch, Columbus newspaper reporter that she had a lot of plant-based and vegan things on the menu. She said, you really can't operate a restaurant in Columbus, Ohio unless you cater to that population. Now, isn't that a change, right? Okay, so did that happen? Right, <laughs> fabulous. Oh, and by the way, I used to go into restaurants and tell them I was a vegetarian. They go, oh, you're a veterinarian? I go, no, no, no. Okay. So, so my point is, why did that happen? Do you think that Kroger and Trader Joe and all the restaurants in Columbus got together, they had a meeting, they said, you know what, we want to do something really good for the people in Franklin County. So we're going to get together, we're going to feed them healthy food, and they'll come around. That's not what happened. People in Columbus demanded that it change. They, started pay, they were willing to pay for it. And that goes back to what I said. We're all here, we're passionate about this because we want to change things. You have to help us do it because if we start creating a different demand for a different product and a different way of doing things, eventually that's where the shift will happen. It's the tipping point. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a great book about it. I want to see this get to the tipping point. I was going to add a little comment about Columbus. <laughs> so you know, it's actually been good to be on the academic circuit talking about plant-based nutrition. I did almost the entire Big Ten, including Ohio State. And I was there right after White Castle, <laughs> which originated in Columbus, had started the veggie slider. Mm -hmm. So is that, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was so full of oil that Dr. Esselstyn yeah, would not approve. It. it was not edible. <laughs> but at least there was no animals in it. Mm -hmm. so.